Today we are on Palm Sunday as we enter the Holy Week that just reminds us of that week's journey that led Jesus up the hill of Golgotha. And today we're continuing this series, we've been calling it Finding Jesus, it's God's redemptive story. That is God's redemptive story, that Jesus paid it all. So today I want to continue what I started last week. Don't worry, if you joined us last week, we're going to continue the list. But even if you didn't, today's going to stand alone. We're looking at Moses. So join me in Exodus, starting with chapter 3. We're going to talk about 10 life lessons from Moses. We're in part 2, and so I'm going to be doing lessons 6 through 10. Give you the second 5. Gave you 5 last week. If you missed that, spring breakers, then you can go to blackhawk.fyi and catch up on the first part. We were in Exodus 2 last week. 10 life lessons from Moses. And I want to recap for you briefly the timeline of Moses' life. The timeline of Moses' life. Here are the three segments that we looked at last week. I want you to know you can look at Moses in three 40-year blocks. He died at the age of 120. Deuteronomy 34 verse 6 tells us that. And believe it or not, it's actually Acts chapter 7. Again, the harmony of scriptures, all of these different time frames and eras and generations all culminate to help us find and point to Jesus. And Moses' life is just such a life. We learn the ages that Moses was in these phases at Acts chapter seven. He was a baby boy born to be killed. He was born in an era where the baby boys of the Hebrew nation, the nation of Israel, were to be slaughtered because of the growing number of them. Exodus chapter one, verse seven says, they filled the lands and all of these baby boys were to be killed. Moses was one of those boys, but he goes from being doomed to being delivered. His mom puts him in a basket, sends him down a river and none other than Pharaoh's own daughter, the same household, the same authority, that would have him to be killed, he is now saved and delivered by that same household. And Pharaoh's own daughter ends up paying Moses' mother, who sent him down the river to begin with, to nurse him and care for him. He's a baby boy. This is Exodus chapter two. And his big blunder, what happened with his big blunder? Pop quiz, big blunder for those who were here last week. What did he do at age 40? He killed the Egyptian. He identified with his people. He had good motives, but he did a bad thing. And last week we talked some about permanent consequences coming from temporary emotional decisions. If you can relate, check out last week. But his big blunder, he was 40 years of age, and then Pharaoh sought to kill Moses. And Moses fled, and he went to the land of Midian. And Exodus chapter 2, verse 15 says he sat down at a well, and he thought his life was over. And he became a shepherd there. Uh, in the land of Midian. And now we pick up with the third part of this, which is the burning bush. He goes from a baby boy, age 40. He has his big blunder. Now get this, at age 80, some of you thought God was done with you. Some of you thought you were too old. Moses is gonna prove you wrong today. His burning bush experience with God that then would kickstart the greatest miracles that God would do through his life happens at the age of 80. And I gotta introduce and reintroduce you to my friend to get us there, Mr. Leapfrog. I introduced you last week to Mr. Leapfrog, but for those of you who may just be joining us, Mr. Leapfrog is not just a picture of the 10 plagues that God would use Moses to bring on Egypt to show that he is going to deliver his people from bondage and slavery in Egypt. It reminds us of that, but I told you a story about Dr. Bill Purvis, who has been a mentor of mine, and he told me that uh, at age 21, he said, Kevin, God will leapfrog you Mr. Leapfrog, he will leapfrog you to put you wherever he wants to put you, however he wants to put you there. And that was the first life lesson. I'm gonna give my best shot at remembering what I told you last week. See if I can remember my own sermon. It was the longest point I probably ever preached to you. And that is that God can put you wherever he wants you, however he wants to get you there, over, around, and through anything or anyone that's in the way. Mr. Leapfrog, Moses is a picture of this. God does with Moses things that he could never do for himself. And God will put you and me wherever he wants us, however he wants us to get there. If you feel inadequate for that to apply to you, then Moses' journey and today's message is right on time, I do believe. So let's go back now to these 10 life lessons from Moses. I'm gonna give you number six right after I read to you, Exodus chapter three, verses one through three. You ready for the word today, church? Exodus three. Verse number one, now Moses, he's in Midian now. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. 
He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And from this, we see some movements happening. We see a move of God, but we see Moses taking some steps as well. And number six of these lessons is this, that moves of God always necessitate movement on our part. And as you think of New Testament scriptures that picture this, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8, 9, and 10 remind us of this, that we were dead at the beginning of the chapter. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God showed up. God sent his son and we're saved by grace through faith, not of works or we would boast about it. And verse 10 reminds us so that we can become his workmanship. It was moves of God. It was God's work that lead us to movement on our part. It was God's work that leads to us being a workmanship of God. And I want to take you back to Moses. If you were here last week, you remember Exodus 2.15. If you weren't, then you can probably relate. Moses, Exodus 2.15, he's fled. Pharaoh's trying to kill him. And he sits down at a well. He sits down at a well. Some of you have sat down at a well. It's the low point of your life, perhaps. Moses was there, and he felt like everything he knew was over. All the ways God would use him, they were gone. All the things that he had in Egypt, no more. No God could ever use somebody like him. But you know what? He didn't stay there. And this week I've been reminded of the 23rd Psalm. It's often used as a funeral psalm, but oh, it's so much more. My favorite word in the 23rd Psalm is the word through. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. It doesn't say, even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death. We don't pitch a tent there at the wells of our life, like the one Moses sat down at. We go through those moments. We sit for a minute. Maybe we hurt for a while. We certainly grieve, and life is certainly painful. Can I get an amen? Some of you are living it right now. You've gotten all these unexpected things and you see all the ways that life is so difficult. But you know what Moses did? He saw a need as he sat there at the well and these shepherds were not allowing the daughters of the priest of Midian, which would become his father-in-law. He didn't know that at the time though. He didn't know these people, but the shepherds weren't letting the daughters of the priest of Midian draw their water. So he got up and he drove them off. He got up. He got up from the well. He got moving. Now, he didn't know what God was doing to move in his life, but he moved. He took a step. This is the story of Moses. God is doing the work, but Moses kept taking a step. And my friends, listen, that is what God wants to do in your life. Moves of God. If you want a move of God in your life, then take a step. If you want to see the hand of God at work in your life, then get moving. And that doesn't mean leaving something. Listen, in fact, it might mean leaning into something that you would just assume run from. (laughs) that's a step. Sometimes that's the big step. Moses constantly was willing to take a step, even though he was very inadequate. And even though he kicked and screamed many times, as we're going to see even in today's passage, but every time God moves in our life, he uses our movements. He doesn't need us. Listen, come here, secret about God's movement. Some of us, we make it all about us too often. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. That's the secret. Here's the good part. He wants you. He loves you. He calls you. He equips you. What's your part? God's going to do his part. He's faithful. The they in the equation, how people respond to you, you can't do that part either. Some of you have been trying for years. It's time to let that go. God will handle them. God will do his part. Your part is to take a step. Moves of God require, necessitate movement on our part. So how is God moving you these days? Sometimes while we're sitting and waiting, some of you are waiting right now, waiting on something to happen that you thought God was going to do, or maybe you're just waiting to see if anything could ever change, if God could ever do something in your life. You don't even believe there is a move of God, and you're just waiting, waiting, sitting. I don't know where your waiting looks like, but today Moses got up, He took a step, and you know what he did? He stopped sitting at the well, and he started tending sheep. He became a shepherd. So for some of you, here's what God sent me to tell you today. Stop sitting and start getting smelly with a sheep. Start stepping 
Maybe you've been at Blackhawk a really long time and it's been about sitting and soaking and absorbing and, and that's great. We wanna be a safe haven. We want you to be able to come in there, but not to stay there because God, listen, he always meets us where we are, but he never leaves us there. So maybe you're sitting as a part of the Blackhawk family, needs to turn into serving, needs to turn into tithing, needs to turn into giving, needs to turn into launching that ministry thing that God has told you to do in the community. Better yet, let's get real relational and personal for a minute. Maybe it's to not give up on that marriage that you're just hanging on to by a thread in this moment. Maybe it's to love that difficult family member through that difficult thing that you just don't feel like you have anything to offer to. I don't know what your step is, but I wanna challenge you to get stepping. I wanna challenge you to know that the moves of God will move us and cause us to move. And in fact, the moves of God in Moses' life and his steps put him in the hall of fame of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 to 26. Let's look at those together. Hebrews 11, 24 says, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Verse 26, here's what he did. He considered the reproach of who? Here's the thing, before I read the rest, Jesus wouldn't be born until some 1,500 years later after Moses. Did you know that? And we're talking about finding Jesus in God's redemptive story, and now the writer of Hebrews is telling me that, that Moses considered and took on, that's what the words mean, he took on, he pursued, he walked in, he took steps toward the reproach of Jesus. He considered that greater than the wealth of the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses at this point didn't even know what that looked like. He felt blind. You ever feel blind in life? Like you're following God and you're taking steps of faith, but you don't see Jesus anywhere. Moses didn't. Jesus wouldn't be born to hundreds and hundreds of years later. But Moses went from doomed to delivered as a baby to become a deliverer of God's people to ultimately point us to the ultimate deliverer who is Jesus. And he took on the reproach of Jesus to be mistreated, to be looked down on, to be seated at the wells of his life to point us toward a reward that's way bigger than anything even he would have known at the time. What a beautiful picture of finding Jesus, the holistic story, the redemptive story of God. And to go to number seven, so know, first of all, that God wants you to get moving. Start asking, what does that look like? Before I give you number seven, let's read verses four through 10, picking up where we left off. Verse four says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, this is the burning bush moment, God called to him out of the bush, circle and underline these two words, Moses, Moses, two times, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, all kind of ites. Verse nine, and now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. And now the invitation to Moses, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I love verse 10, it's an invitation to relationship and that's really exactly what this next truth, this next life lesson is all about. Number seven is that God's redemptive story is built on his relational character. The whole redemptive story of scripture, of history, of what God is doing in humanity is built on the fact that he is a relational God. In verse 10, he invites Moses. He says, I'm going to send you. Come. He says, come. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to purpose. It's an invitation to God's plans, but it's an invitation to relationship for Moses. And you see the relationship with the people of Israel so well pictured here. Verses six to nine that we just read, God says things like, I've heard their cry. I know their pain. I've come down to deliver them. And God, listen, God has the same heartbeat towards you. Some of you are going through the worst of times right now in your life. And God says to you, I see you. I know you. 
I care about you. I love you. Some of you haven't felt seen or heard or cared for or loved in a long, long time. And God sent me today to remind you that he has never stopped loving you. He sees you, he knows you, he cares for you, and he's got a call for your life. He's got a purpose and a plan, and it's built on his relational character. You see it even in Exodus 2, 24, the previous chapter. He saw the oppression, he he hurt for them, he cared about his people, and he still does today. But I love verse 4 that we just read. As we talk about this fact that God's redemptive story is built on his relational character, he says a very relational thing to Moses in verse 4. Look there again. He says, Moses... Moses. Now, there's about 15 or so times in the Bible where you see a double name, uh, where you see Abram, Abram, where you see Moses, Moses, where you see Simon, Simon. You see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. You see it with Elijah and Elisha, certainly many times with Jesus, Jesus from the cross. In this Holy Week, a good reminder of one of the phrases that he said, he said, my God, my God, Why have you forsaken me two times? It's a sign of intimacy. Every single time where you see a double name, it's a sign of intimacy. It's a sign of relational intimacy in Scripture. And the elders and I were talking after our our previous service, and I've never thought of this before, but it was brought up that in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is telling about the end of time. This, This story is happening in the middle of God's redemptive story, but at the end of that, as we enter into eternity, Jesus says that many are going to come to him in the last days and say, Lord, Lord. But he's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. So Moses, Moses is God saying, I desire intimacy, but may we be careful to not think that we just have intimacy because we show up to church every now and then. God is a relational God. God is not a transactional God. God, listen, if it was a transactional thing, you and me don't have enough money to pay anything to be in the presence of and to be in relationship with God. God's not transactional. God is relational And may we be cautious that we are not claiming intimacy by saying to Jesus in the last days, Lord, Lord, and him say, I don't have a relationship with you. You never trusted in me. You trusted in your own works, your own faith, your grandparents' faith. You trusted in the last day that you could just turn things right around. And listen, I've watched people do that, but you know what it's all based on? It's based on relationship. And that's the invitation. Moses, Moses reminds us that God looks at us and he says, Kevin, Kevin. You fill in the blank, 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 your name. I desire to have an intimate relationship with you now. And then on those last days when we get to be in glory, come Lord Jesus, what a day that is going to be. We say to him, Lord, Lord, and he says, come home. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Listen, I don't say all that to have you in fear. I say that today to remind you that God is a relational God and his redemptive story in your life is all built on a relationship, a personal relationship with him, not on your ability to do transactional things or even, listen, better yet, in our Western society of church culture today, the intellectual side of things, we know Jesus We've got access to every podcast, every book, every version of the Bible, and those things are awesome. But my God says, listen, I am not into an intellectual relationship. I want a relational connection. I'm not into an intellectual faith. I'm into a relational faith. Your faith is in a personal relationship with Jesus, and so maybe it's time. You've been listening to all the sermons, all the podcasts, reading all the books, and those are great, great tools. Why? Because they can ultimately point you back to finding Jesus in your life. Maybe it's time for you to go from intellectual faith to relational faith. Our God's redemptive story is built on relationship. He has a relational character. And I love verse 5 that calls the, the land he was standing on there holy ground. Holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses. Where you're standing right now, that's holy ground. Why is it holy? It's because the presence of God was there. And Jesus would come, and the presence of God would shift from places to people. But even in this story, we're reminded of the awe and wonder that we have when we look to a relational God. But I want to remind you that wherever you are, a seat on a Sunday morning, a couch, riding down the road, wherever you meet with the relational God, and you are in his presence, and guess what? You can't hide from it. That is holy ground. 
And in this Holy Week, Passion Week, as we often call it, where Jesus wrote in, today's Palm Sunday. And we call it Palm Sunday because people waved palm branches as Jesus would ride on a donkey into Jerusalem, ultimately to fulfill his mission of going up the hill called Golgotha to pay a price for our sin that we could never pay. And he rode in and and people cried out because listen, they thought the Messiah would come and he would save them politically, nationally, economically, authoritatively, all of these elites in their life. They had all these prescriptions for what the Messiah would do, but Jesus came to save them spiritually. And he came in a way that they couldn't even begin to fathom. And as Jesus came in, they waved their palm branches, they put their cloaks in the road and they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest, as we've sung. And that comes even from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is actually a prophecy about the coming Messiah, hundreds of years before he would come and before he would be born. And they shouted, Hosanna, which literally means save us now. That's what Hosanna means. So they're shouting, save us now. But boy, they didn't know what holy ground they were standing on. They thought somebody was gonna come overthrow Rome. Jesus said, I've come to overcome the world. I've come to overcome sin. I've come to do a much bigger thing than you could even begin to imagine. And there would be a shift from their desperation saying, save us now, to hypocrisy. Because the same people who said, save us now, Hosanna in the highest, would later shout, crucify him. And may we be reminded, it was my sin that put him there. I'm that hypocrite. I'm the one who shouts Hosanna in one moment and crucify him in the next. But you know what Jesus did? He kept moving. Why? Because God's redemptive story is built on his relational character and he valued more than escaping all of that because he could have snapped his fingers and it would have all been over and everyone around him would have fallen dead at the name and the power and the authority of Jesus. Why did he not do that? Because he valued more than he valued getting out of that situation. He valued you and he valued me because my God is a relational God. That is holy ground, my friends. May we live and walk in that holy ground. Let's see what Moses did. I love what happens next because what happens next reminds me of me. In verse 11, let's read verses 11 through 14. But Moses, (laughs) there you go, but Moses. God's doing all this stuff. He's making all this stuff clear, but Moses. You ever, I have a bunch of but Kevin moments in my life. God's doing his part. He's doing things great. It's all clear, but Kevin shows up. You fill in the blank with your name, but There I am. That's what happens with Moses. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. Notice he said, when you have brought the people out of Egypt. There was no if, ands, or buts or question marks with God. When it happens. When I have brought, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I say to them? Fair question. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. From that, we get our eighth of these 10 life lessons, and it's this, that God's name assures us that he is all we need. I love the name of God. I love this passage. They're going to say, who sent you to us? I am has sent you. Who's I am? He, he is. He is. And Moses needed assurance. You ever need some assurance in your life, some reassurance in your life? Maybe you've gotten it before, but you need it. Again, some of you right now in your faith, in your walk with God, you need some reassurance. And I want to remind you today with all of my heart, with every ounce of my being, that God's name alone reminds you that he is all that you need, let alone his faithfulness, let alone his actions, let alone how he has shown you who he is, his name alone reminds us that he is all we need. Moses needed reassurance in two key areas. In verses 11 and 12, he needed assurance in who am I? He asked that. Write these down. Two questions, two areas he needed assurance. Who am I and who are you? Verses 11 and 12, he says, who am I to do this? Why don't you just send somebody else, right? Who am I? He needed assurance about his own identity. He also needed assurance about God's identity. These are 
existential kind of questions, existence, purpose, meaning, hope kind of questions. We all ask these kind of questions. And Moses is asking those questions as we look at this fact that his name reassures us that he is all we need. God's answer was just two words. Here they are. I am. I am. I'm glad I know the great I am. And this is easy preaching stuff right here. I can preach this all day. Everybody will clap and be happy. But let me tell you the hard part about knowing the great I am. I'm going to lead with that, and then I'll end with the good preaching part. Does that sound good? Here's the hard part. If he is, I ain't. Bad English, really good theology. If he's the great I am, that means I am not. That means I need him. That means he is so far superior to me, and I bow at his feet. That part gets kind of hard, isn't it? That's the harder preaching. But listen, when we get that and we realize who God is and live in awe of him, that even his name alone assures us that he is all we need, that he didn't say, I am the I was. He didn't say, I am the I will be. He said, I am the great I am right now. I always have been. I always will be. Since before you knew what time was, before there was creation, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I have been. I was the great I am then. I am the great I am right now. I am the great I am in the worst situation of your life. And I will be the great I am forever and ever. And no one can dethrone me. His name alone reminds us that he is all we need. So when we say, I am broken, God says, I am your completion. When we say, I'm sinful, I'm unworthy, I'm unrighteous, he says, I am your righteousness. When we say, I am afraid, he says, I am your courage. When we say, I am weak, he says, I am strong. When we say, I am confused, he says, I am your clarity. When we say, I am full of questions, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the answer. When we say, I am in need, he says, I am all you need. I'm glad I know the great I am. But my brothers, my sisters, my friends in the room, I need you to know that until Jesus is enough for you, no person or thing will ever be enough. Until you make Jesus your everything, not Jesus plus anything. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Until Jesus is enough for you, nothing you pursue in life will ever be. But I today can let go of all I have because he is all I need. I'm so glad to know him. I'm glad that his name itself reassures me that he's all I need. But then I get his faithfulness. And then I get the work of God in my own life to remind me of that fact. Moses had that too. But before I give you number nine here, which is about timing, some of you are like, we gotta talk about God's timing because it doesn't always make sense. Moses would agree with you. Let's look at the continuation of this conversation here. Go to verses 15 through 20. Let's read that together, picking up where we left off. Verse 15, God said to Moses, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name. Here's his name again. Forever. There's timing stuff. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and to a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 18, and they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. We make plans, but God knows what we're going to run into. And we see that verse 19. He says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. It's a good thing we know one. Verse 20, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. The Israelites have been waiting for this moment for a long time. Moses has waited until he's 80 years old to feel like he could be used by God to do anything. So number nine life lesson here is that God's timing is perfect, but it sure stretches us. Can I get an amen? 
Some of you are living in that right now. We're living in that in, in our church right now, just seasons of transitions and change. Some of you have had diagnosis. Some of you have had problems, things that are unforeseen. God's timing is perfect, and he takes all of the bad things even, much less the good things, and he works them all together for his good and for his glory and for our own good as we love him and are following after him. That's where the timing sure does stretch us. Moses got that. The Israelites got that as they waited on God to bring deliverance. Moses, remember, how old is he again? He's 80. 80. Any 80-year-olds in the building? You don't have to raise your hand. I ain't calling you out like that. But I know some of you are 80. I baptize a couple of you that are that old. And listen, you're a testimony that God's never done. And so I don't care if you're 80 or 800. If God's not done with you, you're not finished. And Moses reminds us of that. Even through his big blunders, he was a murderer. You think your big blunder got in the way. I'm guessing you wouldn't sit here. We hope maybe you wouldn't be sitting here if you had committed a murder. Maybe you have. Moses did, and God still used him. His timing does not make sense sometimes, but it is always perfect. And it's kind of like this block of wood. It's like your life here. And God's timing will do several different things. God's timing... God's timing, it'll reveal our heart and our motive. You ever notice that? While God makes you wait, you look in the mirror and you realize, man, I didn't even know that about myself. It reveals your own heart. It reveals your own motive. But it also reveals God's heart. It reveals God's motive. And we start to see God for who he really is. The waiting can be times of worship. And God's timing is often like sandpaper. Another thing that God's timing will do, it rubs off the rough edges. God's timing will transform your character. He's building you into something that's pretty rough right now, pr pretty splintery right now. <laughs> How many of you are like, that's me. I'm that rough lump of wood right there for sure. As I was talking about this with some of our, our dear friends, some are in the room, so they came up with a great point that I just got to make. It's, it's kind of like, I'm going to turn it into a dad joke because that's just what I do. It's just the humor I got. So here's what it is. It's going to rub off the rough edges and it's going to transform your character, but God's timing, just like sandpaper, will also rub you the wrong way. Woo, that'll preach. Yeah, buddy, it'll rub you. The, how many of you, God's timing's been rubbing you the wrong way lately? You just can't make sense of it. But God's sanding. Look at all that mess. It's coming off and he's getting you ready. And that's what he's been doing with Moses. He's been sanding. Sorry, you need some goggles down front. I'll slide back. God's been sanding Moses and he's been preparing. Listen, it was after Moses was 80, after the burning bush experience, that God did the greatest miracles in Moses' life that he ever could have ever imagined and seen possible. God did his greatest work, his greatest miracles when Moses thought he was done. He had sat down at the well. He thought he'd be a shepherd forever. Little did he know God was just sanding. God was transforming his character to get him ready for things he never dreamed possible. And because that same God loves you, you can put a smile on. Even when God's timing is rubbing you the wrong way. I'm a, I'm a pretty good artist, right? You got, hey, you can make fun of it all day, but you'll remember that face this week. Hopefully more of that one than this one, right? Can I get an amen? God's timing is perfect, but boy, it sure stretches uh, so I want to give you number 10, and to do that, I want to take you to chapter 4 of Exodus. Chapter 4 of Exodus, this conversation just keeps on going. It keeps continuing, and I want to read it to you. Exodus 4, verse 10, we see that Moses said to the Lord, and this is, by the way, after the first snake handling church. i got to tell you this real quick. It's really cool. Uh, it's first snake handling church experience. You, you don't believe me? Verses 1 through 9, he talks about the signs that he's going to give, and he says, what's that you got in your hand there, Moses? And he says, it's a staff, and, and, he's, and he turns it into a snake. And it says that Moses ran away. <laughs> I told you I can relate with Moses. I'm running too. If my staff turns into a snake, I'm going to run away too. And God says, grab it by the tail. Pick it up. <laughs> Boy, that'll stretch you. And after that, Moses is still having this conversation. That's where we pick up in verse 10. Let's read it together. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? What makes him mute? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Can you relate? Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, 
is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. Number 10 is simply this, that God's capacity is always bigger than our capability. And Moses reminds us of that. He says, I can't do this. I'm not eloquent. What's your I'm not? I'm not blank. If you had to write it down right now, what would you write down? I'm not blank. What's your excuse? I'm not blank. Moses says, I'm not eloquent. And then he says, I love this, the part where he says, even after I've talked with you, I'm still not eloquent. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, I, I would have thought if you're asking me to do this that you'd make me stop stuttering, but I still stutter. I still got that problem. And God does two things. He says, I'm gonna do all the work. I am all you need. But as a token, even through the anger that the Lord felt, I, I made me wonder how many times has God been angry at me? The anger of the Lord was kindled with Moses. I wonder how many times I kindled that fire. Mm, got you to thinking now, right? I know I have all the time, but you know what God does? He, sent, he just says, I'm gonna send Aaron, your brother. And so we see the character of God in Moses' inadequacies and we also see the community that he has with other people, the collaboration that he has with other people. He sends Aaron because God's capacity, his abilities are way bigger than what I am capable of. And Moses reminds us of that. And I've read this list to you. There's a list of Bible excuses. I wonder if you can relate with any of them. I want to read it to you again. It starts with Moses. Moses stuttered, David's armor didn't fit, Hosea married a prostitute, David had an affair, Solomon had too much money and too many women, Abraham was too old, Timothy had ulcers, Paul was ugly, Jeremiah was suicidal, Elijah suffered from depression, Paul was a murderer, so was Moses, so was David, John the Baptist dressed weird and ate bugs, Samson needed a haircut, Zacchaeus was too short, David was only a teenager, so was Mary, the mother of Jesus, so was Daniel, and my personal favorite, Lazarus was dead. <laughs> What's your excuse? I'm not blank. God would deliver and the Israelites would walk out of Egypt, but they would come on another obstacle. That obstacle was the Red Sea. The Red Sea is considered some 1,200 miles long, 130 to 230 miles wide, and up to 7,200 feet deep. Pretty big obstacle. Pretty big excuse. You know what God did? He split that sea so they could walk right through it. Not just walk right through it. I love the next part. On dry ground. Not only does God do the impossible, he takes the impossible up a notch. That's who we serve. That God that we serve has that kind of capacity that goes way beyond what we are capable of. So I wanna go back to my question I shared with you last week. What, what has God called you to do that you don't feel equipped to accomplish? I asked you last week, I asked you again today. And I tie it together by looking at Moses, looking at the relational character of God, how God is the one who moved, but Moses took steps, and how God's name assures us he is all that we need, even though his timing is like sandpaper and it hurts, we can put a smile on and keep moving because God's capacity is way bigger than what we're capable of. I remind you today that in the life of Moses and in the life of me and in the life of you, that God doesn't always call the equipped, but he always equips the called. What is he calling you to do? What step do you need to take? If you wanna move of God in your life, let's get moving this week. I wanna ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment. Some of you are here and you're a believer. You've been following Jesus for a long time and yet God is calling you out into the deep waters. He's calling you to stay when it'd be easier to run. He's calling you to go and step beyond your comfort zone. He's calling you to be an ambassador, to represent his kingdom in a world that is so dark, to be light, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to trust in God, to do what you cannot do. What is it that God is calling you towards today? Yet some of you today, you would say, I just don't know that I have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But the gospel is simple, it's that we're all sinners and we are destined for a place called hell, eternal separation for God. But God, while we were yet sinners, he died for us and he loved us enough that if we just believe in him, we won't die, but we'll have eternal life. You can pray something like this saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you today to save me. 
I know you are who you say you are. I know you live that sinless life I couldn't live and you paid a price that I could never pay on that cross. I know you're alive. You rose from the dead. I believe it with all of my heart. Today I give you me. Will you forgive me? Will you save me? Whatever your next step is in this moment, will you take it as we reflect for a moment but as we respond to what God's doing in our hearts?